Uh, in probate, I see an MHP perha perhaps for grief counseling, perhaps for uh, counseling uh, with families in a will contest to help these people work some issues out. Some lawyers are capable of doing a lot more with their clients in that area than others. I think family lawyers, for the most part, are much better in doing some not professional counseling, but causing people to think about different options, how to get along better, how to communicate better. Other lawyers don't want any part of that. They don't want to be involved. That's not their job. They're, they're there strictly to get the case settled. So I think the use of people in the collaborative, civil collaborative process is going to be dependent on number one, the lawyers that you have, number two, the needs of the parties, number three, the dispute and who you need for it. In a construction dis dispute, I'm going to have an engineer. Uh, in an intellectual property dispute, I'm going to have an expert that knows about whatever, we're, whatever kind of, of um, product we're talking about. Uh, in a t tort action, uh, I'll need an economics damages expert. So it's not going to be the same person every time. Whereas in the family, you pretty much are going to be using the same people over and over. But uh, we believe, and uh, our philosophy is pretty much in GCLC, that you get the parties together, you, the parties decide with the lawyers, what experts are going to be necessary and select those experts rather than imposing a preconceived idea because this is not a one-size-fits-all. This is supposed to be designed for the client and client-driven. Consequently, I can't come and say, this is my model and you will have these people on my team. Um, maybe some people <laughs> can do that, but Personally, I, I don't think that that is very client-oriented or focused, and I don't think that's the way to do it. That doesn't mean I'm right and they're wrong. It just means that this is where I'm comfortable, because there's certainly room for a lot of models in the process, and people just have to discover what they're comfortable with and what works for them and for their clients. In terms of your collaborative practice, uh, in the beginning, I think it's very difficult just to say, you know, I'm a full-time collaborative lawyer because it's going to be a transition time for you. When I made the transition, I just chose to quit litigation altogether. So I'm not advising anybody to totally quit your day job the way I did. But um, you will find as this picks up that there'll be uh, more and more cases available for you and instead of you spending all your time on two or three huge cases that are keeping you up all hours of the day and night preparing for hearings and trial and worrying because your client is not going to be a good witness and they won't present well or what's going to happen at the deposition you can forget about all that you'll have more clients you'll do more cases but there will be a lot less stress and I don't mean they won't be hard work because figuring out alternative solutions to situations is a lot harder than just throwing up your hands and saying well I'll see you at the courthouse because you don't have that option if you're going to be a successful collaborative lawyer you have to stick in there you have to keep working on things you have to keep gathering more information you have to keep looking for new ways to get things accomplished so it is much more challenging, I think, that in many ways that it requires a lot more creativity than litigation does. And eventually you begin to build a practice, your name gets out, and uh, you can do quite well in, in the collaborative area. Right now, of course, family is much better known than civil but I want to encourage the civil people to continue because there's a lot of interest. And one of the primary areas right now that we're seeing interest in is medical error, which you might call medical malpractice. Uh, many, many hospitals have become very interested in the idea of full disclosure. 
And of course, this is unheard of amongst the insurance companies and the defense lawyers because the first thing that usually happens when there's a medical error is it's reported to the insurance company and the insurer says don't talk to them. Well, the worst thing that can happen to someone who has been injured or to the family of that person is for all communication to immediately be shut off. Because if they didn't suspect a problem before, they do now. And they're angry, they're hurt, they're confused, they want information. And the old way of doing things is not to give them that information. And we're finding today that hospitals who are able to just disclose everything, this is what happened. Once the people know, sometimes they don't even want anything else. They just want to know what happened. It's also interesting that my understanding of the statistics is that many times it's discovered that there was no medical error. More times than not, the person's uh, physical condition was such that this would have happened anyway. Perhaps the person used their medication wrong. Uh, there's a number of things that could have happened. But when there is a medical error, if the hospital or the physician or whoever's responsible admits to it, says this is it, uh, people don't go to court. They, they save so much time, so much money. It improves the hospital's uh, stature in the community. People trust them more. It's, it's just becoming the way to handle those kinds of cases. In addition to that, many times an apology is much more beneficial for the doctors and the medical staff than it even is for the patient because I didn't think about this until I got into the collaborative process. But can you imagine when someone puts their care, their life, literally in your hands and you make a mistake, how that must feel? So this, many times doctors have trouble with addiction, all kinds of problems, and some of it's because things happen and they're never allowed to do anything about it. They can't apologize, they can't make amends in any way. Under this kind of a program, they can do something about what happened and it will help the medical profession every bit as much as it will help the patients. So that's an excellent area that I see for this. Another area is construction. And in construction, um, a recent situation where there was a problem with a foundation in these people's house was just really going to rack and ruin because the foundation was moving. And of course, the more it moved, the bigger the cracks in the walls, the kitchen cabinets are falling down. Something needed to be done. Their lawyer was going to go file suit at the courthouse. And I said, could we just try one meeting and see what happens? Because would you rather have your client's place fixed in two or three months or two or three years if you go to court? He agreed to one meeting. Before we ever met, we all agreed upon an engineer. We had the engineer's report sent to everyone before the first meeting and the case was settled in one two-hour session. Can you imagine how long that would have gone on? And they began repair work the following week before discovery would even have been served. They were beginning to fix this person's problem. So the construction area is excellent. And I mean, this was just a residential dispute. But in a dispute that involves large buildings, lots of money, People need to get their money out. Other people need to move in and use the facility and something goes wrong. I can't imagine a better way to hurry up and get things settled on part of both sides and continue on with the project than to use the collaborative process. And the great thing about it in construction, everybody wants to fix it so you have a definite underlying goal that is motivating people to go forward.